Hi, I'm Eric Marienthal, and welcome to Tricks of the Trade. I want to thank you very much for getting this video, and I hope you get a lot out of the things that I'm planning to show you. This is a very interactive video in the sense that I'm going to be doing a lot of playing, and you're going to be doing a lot of playing as well. During the course of this video, we're going to be going over some ideas and licks for soloing, um, how to incorporate more rhythm in your playing. Um, we're going to learn some trick licks, as I call them, and some high note licks as well how to get a good growling sound when you want to, and how to use multiphonics on high notes and that split tone sort of a sound, and some tips on playing in front of an audience. So get your horns out and let's get ready to learn some tricks of the trade. Out of all the clinics I've ever done, or out of all the students who have ever come over to my house, I think the most uh, frequently asked question of me is, can you teach me some licks? Now, a player might practice for eight hours a day till they're blue in the face, uh, and it's very important to practice a lot of technique, but it's also very helpful to have some ideas under your belt as far as soloing and playing in a band. What I've done for this first part of the video is record five different tracks, and each of these tracks deals with a different chord or a chord progression. And for each of these progressions, I've written a solo, essentially, uh, that we're going to learn from start to finish and then pick apart and learn certain licks out of. So, Let's get started. Okay, this first track we're going to work with deals with major seven chords. Now, it's very important. I'm sure you're going to hear me say it's very important at least 100 times during the course of this video, so you might want to get used to it. Uh, but it is very important to make sure that you know um, all of your major scales. Number one, so much of music is based on major scales. And number two, this track that I've recorded deals with major seven chords in every key. Uh, what I want to do for you now is to play through this uh, solo over the uh, progression that you see in your booklet and the solo as well you see. Um, so follow along as I play this and give you an idea of what it sounds like. Okay, now, it's probably not the greatest idea in the world to go into an improvising situation um, having your solo completely contrived. Number one, you're not really improvising that way, and number two, it's going to end up sounding very contrived. But it's a good idea to have some ideas going into a solo that you might want to use. Um, now, the next thing I'm going to do, and what I'm going to have you do in a minute, is that I'm going to play this whole solo one more time from start to finish. But this time, I'm only going to play certain licks out of the solo and improvise around them. Uh, the point is that whether I'm playing um, a lick that I know I'm going to be playing or something that I'm just going to be making up, um, you want to make sure that both fit into the rhythm section and, and feel good time-wise. OK, well, let me give you an example of what I mean.
Well, here's where the interaction of the video comes in. Now, it's your turn to play. Um, what you might want to do is turn your machine off or put it on pause for a bit, uh, work on the solo, um, and then what's going to happen now in the video is that the track is going to play by itself for a few choruses, a bit longer than what you just heard, uh, without me. So you can play it much like a music minus one type of a record or CD. Uh, the first time you play through it, play my entire solo from start to finish, and uh, the next time, do what I just did, which is to pick out certain licks from the solo and um, then improvise around them. And each time you do this, pick out a different lick or a different series of licks um, from my solo and improvise around those. Okay, have fun. Okay, this next track deals with a progression of minor seven chords. Uh, the progression, as you can see, is a 16-bar progression. Uh, the first eight bars is D minor seven concert, uh, followed by four bars of E flat minor seven uh, concert, and then four bars of D flat minor seven concert. Um, you know, one of the fun things about playing over minor chords is that not only can you derive your notes of your solo from the various minor scales, but you can also uh, use notes from the minor pentatonic scale, which is root, flat third, fourth, fifth, flat seventh, and octave. Uh, I've tried to incorporate notes from all those different scales uh, in the solo that I've written over this progression, so follow along in your book as I play through this one.
Okay, well between these licks and the licks that we went over during the major chord exercise, I think there may be some things that you can use. Of course, we have quite a few more to come, so uh, stay tuned. Um, anyway, I'm going to do what I did before, which is to play the solo. And as I do, uh, rather than play the whole thing verbatim, I'm going to pick out certain licks of the solo and then improvise around those. Then I'm going to have you do the same thing in just a bit. So follow along as I give you an example of what I want you to do. Well, you have the routine down by now, I'm sure. Um, what I want you to do is learn the solo. Go ahead and put your machine on pause like we did before. Uh, once you've played the whole solo through the upcoming track, uh, go ahead and um, work on certain licks and incorporate them into your solo. Make sure that whether you're playing one of my licks or one of your licks, that they all feel good and fit in comfortably with the rhythm section. Okay, go for it. Okay, now it's time to play the blues. Uh, I'm sure if you've ever gone to a jam session, as I have, um, you show up to the, um, the stage and everybody's trying to figure out what tune to play. If nobody can figure out a tune to play, somebody inevitably will yell out, let's play a blues. Um, 
so I have written a uh, progression, uh, just a standard 12 bar progression over some uh, typical dominant chords um, for this next track. And for this track, you guessed it, I wrote a solo, uh, three choruses of this blues progression. So follow along in your booklet as I play my solo. Okay, you're probably figuring out um, at this point, and wisely so, that it's a good idea to write out some solos over some tunes that you're playing. Uh, when I was in high school, I had the great opportunity to study with um, the wonderful tenor saxophone player Warren Marsh. And Warren gave me this idea uh, as far as writing out a solo for tunes that I was working on. So for each uh, lesson, he would have me write a solo, um, a different course on a different tune, uh, one solo per day. So every, every uh, week I'd show up to his um, his lesson and with seven solos in my hand and we go over them and, and it was just a really good help as far as working on improvisation. Okay, well I want to play through my solo one more time and yes, you got it, I'm going to play my solo and uh, however I'm just going to play certain licks out of the solo and then improvise around those. Once again, whether you're playing uh, some of these licks or licks that you're making up on your own, um, make sure that they all feel comfortable and fit right into the rhythm section. Okay, here we go. Okay, well it's back to you. Now it's your turn to play along with the track without me. Um, so I want you to learn my solo from start to finish. Uh, go ahead and put the machine on pause once again if you want to. Um, then turn the machine back on and the track will play once again uh, quite a few choruses of the blues so you can get into it for a while. Play my solo down from start to finish and then uh, play once again playing certain licks out of my solo and then incorporate your own licks over um, the ones from mine that you're not going to play. You're going to see my solo once again along with the changes in your booklet. So go ahead and read there and you'll see the um, chord changes, a chord chart on the screen as the track is going by. So have fun.
Okay, another very often asked question of me during uh, lessons is, can you teach me some licks over 2-5-1 progressions? And what I usually tell my students is that um, it's simple in the sense that the 2 and the 5 chord are related diatonically to the 1 chord. So you can play the same scale over all three chords. What, make, what makes your lines more interesting is that if you incorporate the strong part of each chord uh, in your lines as you play through the 2-5-1 progression. That's what I try to do in this solo over my 2-5-1s uh, that we're going to play over now. The progression runs um, in 2-5-1s that each repeat once. So you hear each 2-5-1 twice. And then they descend in half steps. And, and by doing that, they keep going until we've gone through all 12 keys. So let me play my solo for you now. You might want to sit back and get a little comfortable because uh, this may take a little while. Okay, I think the best piece of advice I can give you is that when you improvise, it's the same as writing a melody in your head. You're actually writing a song, so in the same sense that you're writing music, you're also using space. Um, out of all the years that I've played with Chick Corea, I think his greatest piece of advice whenever I'd ask him what to play over certain changes was to, number one, make sure you use some space. I'm not quite sure what he was trying to tell me with that, but uh, anyway, it was good advice. So what I want to do for you now is to play my solo once again, and yes, you've got it. I'm going to play certain licks and then improvise around those. So, um, and of course, I'm going to have you do the same thing. So let me give you an example of what I'm having you do. Thank you. 
Well, have at it. I'm now going to turn it over to you. The next thing you're going to hear, once again, will be the same track. Um, the progression is going to repeat two or three times, so um, follow along uh, out of your booklet. Make sure you play the whole solo first, so learn it, then play along with the track, then pick certain licks out of the solo. Um, again, you want to make sure that it's fitting in nicely with the rhythm section, and each time you play through the solo, try to pick out uh, different licks and incorporate those into your own solo. All right, good luck. Well, next time you go to a jam session, if they don't call a blues, very often the next most common tune will be something written over rhythm changes. And so I've written a solo over these changes. I uh, chose this particular set of chord changes because it incorporates uh, the four different changes and chord progressions that we've talked about so far. Uh, major, minor, dominant, and two five ones. Uh, one thing about rhythm changes that sometimes makes it a bit perplexing to play over is that uh, the changes go by pretty quickly, and if you start falling behind a little bit, uh, you might get lost in the dust. So anyway, let me play through the solo for you as you follow along in your booklet. thank my good buddy Dave Witham, great uh, keyboard player from LA, who helped me um, record and sequence these tracks. 
sound pretty good. Um, okay, well, I'm going to now play uh, the same solo. I'm going to have you do the same thing, so pay attention. Same solo, and uh, I'm going to pick out certain licks to play, and I'm going to improvise other, over um, others. So, and as I play along, I'm going to really be concentrating um, half on what I'm playing and half on the rhythm section. I'm really going to make sure that what I play fits right in time-wise um, and harmonically to what the rhythm section is playing. And I want you to do the same thing. So let me give you an example. Well, once again, it's back to you. Uh, the track is going to play for quite some time, um, three or four choruses. So uh, have fun with this. Make sure you get into the solo. And um, once you've played the whole solo with the track, um, pick apart certain licks and play it with your own improvisation. OK, have fun. Having good rhythm in your solo is just as important as having good melodic content in your solo. You could be playing some of the greatest melodies ever heard, but if it's not fitting in rhythmically with the rhythm section, it's still not going to feel quite as good. For this part of the video, I want you to have two tools. Number one, I want you to have a metronome, 
and number two, a tape recorder. Uh, what I'm going to do is play with my metronome. I'm going to set it at a comfortable tempo. I've got mine set at 120, but you want to be varying your speeds as you do this exercise. Um, and I'm going to try to create a groove rather than just playing exercises. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's very important to always use your metronome no matter what you're playing or what you're practicing. Um, but uh, for this, I'm going to try to create a certain groove. Um, I'm going to play like an even eighth note R&B kind of a groove. So the eighth notes are sort of a, a duple feel. And um, the, the point is that if I can create a good rhythmic feel with just using the very stark clicks of a metronome, then certainly when it comes time to play in a band, it's going to feel very, very good. So uh, let me give you an example of what I want you to do in a moment. Okay, now again, the idea is to be thinking um, half about what you're actually playing and half have your concentration on the metronome, or if you're playing in a band, on whatever's providing, you know, the, the time, the pulse. Uh, I always listen to the drums, either the um, overheads, the cymbals, or, you know, the backbeat of the snare. Anyway, now I'm going to change up my style and play over a, try to create a swing groove. So I want you to do the same thing. I'm going to change my uh, tempo here on the metronome um, to make it a little bit slower and um, uh, play, I'm going to play at 112. So here we go. All right, so do that for a while. Again, really concentrate on the clicks of the metronome um, and think about how well you're locking in. Uh, so use tool number two, your tape recorder. Um, simply make sure that you're recording yourself as you play. Um, you know, you're thinking about so many things when you're doing this exercise. You're thinking about creating a good sound, playing, uh, what notes to play, what rhythm to play them in, and you're thinking about the uh, clicks of the metronome as well. If you record yourself uh, while you play like this, you can simply listen back to the tape recorder and uh, not concentrate on all these other things. You can put all of your attention on what's actually coming out of your instrument. And, and by doing so, you'll be able to pick out the things that may not have quite sounded as good as you like, and you can work on them. Okay, this next section of the video I very affectionately refer to as trick licks. Uh, what I've done is record yet another track. It's definitely an R&B-ish kind of a track. Uh, it's another 16-bar form, the first eight bars of which are uh, G7 concert, then it goes to four bars of B-flat 7 concert, and four bars of C7 concert. Um, and, as you can see in your book, I wrote um, 25 licks. I put them in solo context. It's basically a written solo, and I, I numbered each lick, 1 through 25. Um, well, I'd like to play through the solo for you now and have you give a listen to what these trick licks sound like.
Okay, well, let me give you a few pointers um, referring to a few of these licks. Uh, if you look in your book on number 14, um, I've got those trills marked over the uh, first three quarter notes. And what I did was to, on each of those notes, just trill on my uh, side high E key. So you can um, use that in a lot of different uh, ways. Uh, lick 17, I did the same thing. I just stayed on B and did that trill up to, um, well, it basically sounds like D. It's a very popular one. Um, and when you play that lick, actually, when you, especially over minor chords or dominant chords, it sounds good to go uh, from the fifth up to the flat seventh and make that sort of a trill. So if you're playing in, if I were playing in, in D7 or D minor, uh, A to C natural sounds cool. And C. And so on. Uh, what's another one here? Oh, um, on uh, lick, what is that? Lick tw the 21, uh, where I wrote the pluses um, over a few of those Fs. On the pluses, I'm using a overtone of low B flat. So on the ones that don't have a plus, I'm just playing normal B flat, and the pluses are an overtone of low B flat, and I've still got my octave key down. And you can use that um, over all those low note overtones. For F sharp, you could do low B. And uh, low C can give you the overtone of G. Like that. Uh, the rest are pretty self-explanatory, so I'm going to let the track, uh, the track run now by itself for uh, quite a while, so you can have some fun with this. Make sure you learn the whole solo um, from start to finish, and then pick apart a certain licks, and you got it. Use them in your own improvisation. All right, have fun with my trick licks. On my last DCI video called Modern Sax, I talked about how to play high notes, how to get a good sound on those notes and the fingerings that I use. Uh, for this video, you've guessed it, I'm going to play uh, and teach you some high note licks. Yes, indeed. Uh, before we do, though, I want to go over uh, some of the things that it takes to get a good uh, sound on those high notes. Um, actually, the rules on getting a good sound up there is the same, are the same as getting a good sound on the rest of the horn. You want to follow the big three rules. Rule number one is that you want to make sure that your lip isn't um, bearing down too much on the reed. Uh, you want to play with as relaxed an armature as possible. The more the reed vibrates, the bigger your sound. Number two, you want to make sure your throat is nice and open. Uh, the way to achieve that is to uh, pretend like you're speaking in a very low voice. When you do that, your throat really opens up. And so try to assimilate that when you play. And number three, um, use a lot of air and support from your diaphragm. You want to always be um, feeling as though you're pushing from your stomach, from your diaphragm, and, and pushing that air up into your horn. 
Okay, now what I want to do is uh, close up on my saxophone. I want to show you some fingerings uh, that I use uh, for these altissimo notes. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the alternate fingering for high E. Uh, we all know the normal palm key fingering is um, this fingering. Uh, the fork fingering or plateau fingering is to use uh, plateau high F um, and then the uh, two and three fingers on the left hand. Uh, for the note F, you want to just lift up the G key and just use the plateau key and uh, the number two key uh, on your left hand. Um, for F sharp, it's the same fingering, and now we're going to add the side uh, low, the side B flat, and that gives us our F sharp. For high G, uh, still got my octave key down. Um, actually, I'm going to be using my octave key for all these fingerings. Um, anyway, the fingering for high G is one and three on the left hand and one and three on the right hand. Uh, for G sharp, I'm, I've got the same fingering as G, and uh, I'm going to add side C over here. For high A, it's two and three in the left hand and one, two, three in the right hand. Um, actually, the, the right hand is optional. Sometimes the note comes out a little bit easier uh, when you just use two and three in the left hand. Sound, the, the sound of the note is actually much bigger, however, if you make it if you give it the long uh, fingering, which incorporates one, two, three in the right hand. Um, as far as high B flat goes, um, two different fingerings there as well. You can play simply the, the overtone of high C sharp. It sounds actually better and much more in tune if you uh, press down the G key, the number three uh, key in your left hand. It locks the pitch in better. Uh, for high B, I use the overtone of uh, side D still with this G-sharp uh, G key down. For high C, it's the overtone of uh, side E-flat, the normal high um, three-ledger line E-flat, uh, still with this down here. Uh, for high C-sharp, um, I use the overtone of E, and for high F, I can, or high D, rather, I use the overtone of either the overtone of high uh, F or just fork F right here. So let me play those for you right now. Okay, now it's time for my high note licks. Um, what I've done here is very similar to what I did over my trick licks, actually. Uh, we're going to play over the same track. It's going to play uh, for you after I'm done demonstrating these licks. Um, what I did uh, was to write an entire solo of high note licks. I'm going to see if I can um, make my way through this entire solo and have you follow along. Well, <laughs> um, go ahead and play through these licks. Now, obviously, um, if you were to play the entire solo down from beginning to end, number one, would it sound um, uh, a little monotonous and you might uh, get a few dogs barking at your front door, uh, but you also may put a hole in your lips, so be very um, careful when you practice this. Um, go ahead and play the whole solo if you want, but more importantly, take certain licks out of this uh, solo that you may be able to incorporate in your own solo. All right, have fun with this one.
Okay, let me talk about three different ways that you can get a good growling sound. Number one, you can actually do a flutter tongue kind of effect where you do that kind of a thing against the tip of the mouthpiece. Uh, number two, you can actually sing into the horn as you play. You want to sing rather loud, I suppose, to get enough air to um, get the horn to sound. Uh, what I do is I actually let a little air escape from the side of my mouth and buzz the side of my mouth um, to get the same effect. Let me show you what I mean. <laughs> well, when I do that, you can probably, when it's just one-on-one uh, -on -one and I'm not playing with anybody else, uh, you can probably hear a little bit of that air escaping. Uh, I can assure you, though, when you're playing with a band, um, you really can't hear that so much, when, even when you're playing on a uh, record recording. Um, you can't hear so much. What you can hear does add to the overall effect of the growl, and it sounds kind of cool. Uh, as far as adding multiphonics and getting that split tone sort of a sound on some high notes, um, the way to achieve that is actually by breaking a few of the good tone rules uh, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, what you want to do, uh, first of all, is to bring a little bit of your lip down the reed. Now, I don't mean to bring the mouthpiece into your mouth a whole ton, just to roll your lower lip down the reed and then bear down on the heart of the reed uh, with your lip rather than being relaxed like we were talking about earlier. Uh, at the same time, you want to kind of bring your horn back and have your air skirt across the top of the mouthpiece rather than go straight in. And uh, number three, you want to blow like mad. Um, just blow as hard as you can and overblow. I mean, don't blow as hard as you can, but really use a lot of air. Let me um, try to demonstrate this for you. That was on F sharp. Let me try it on G. All right, well, have fun practicing that one. Okay, now let me talk about some tips as far as playing in front of an audience is concerned. I'm convinced that there's no way to really try, quote unquote, to get the audience to like you. Your playing and your personality have to speak for themselves. If you go to a show and you see a guy performing and he's jumping all over the stage and, and going crazy doing backflips, you can tell if he's really doing it because he's into the music and, and really into creating a good show or if he's just trying to impress uh, the girl in the third row. Uh, there are some ideas I've thought of, both musically and visually, that might help you with communicating with an audience. Um, Number one is to make sure that when you play, that you're playing with conviction. Um, once again, you can listen to a player play and really tell if he's, if he's playing with heart and soul or if he's just kind of going through the motions. Uh, to give you a little example, it'd be like, um, even if you're playing something kind of up high, but without a whole lot of heart in it, it might sound something like this. as opposed to really getting into it and, and really trying to communicate your line and your expression. Um, it certainly is important when you're playing ballad melodies. Now, I'm just making these up, but um, let me give you an example of you know, a low, um, sultry sort of melody that's played without a whole lot of emotion or conviction. as opposed to Now the worst thing you can do is to over emote. I mean, it's good to use um, scoops and bends and that sort of thing, but be very, very careful. In fact, it may not be a bad idea to record yourself um, when you're playing to make sure that you're not using too many uh, scoops or bends or, you know, using tons of vibrato over everything. Make sure you're really in charge of what you're playing. Um, another very important thing is to make sure that you build your solos. Um, if you start your solo on 10 and just plow through the whole solo, uh, just full blast, it's going to sound um, kind of monotonous, actually, to uh, the audience and to the other guys in the band. Um, better idea is to make sure you build your solo. Start a little lower and build them up. That way the whole band will build with you. I'm going to give you a short example of that. Well, 
it's a very abbreviated version of about a four minute solo, but you get the idea. Um, another thought I had was to make sure that you have communication going on between you and other members of the band. I know that in my band, um, the guitar player and I play off of each other quite a lot. We'll play a solo together where I'll play a lick and then he'll play a lick back and we have this cool musical dialogue going on between us. Um, even if you're playing in a small group or a big band, um, the musical communication that goes on between you and the rhythm section is often a lot of fun to play, but it's also very uh, great communicatively with the audience. Uh, if the piano player or the drummer plays something and you play off it or vice versa, creates um, um, great communication and uh, really is a lot of fun. It makes the music really rise that way. Uh, one other thought I had as far as communicating musically is make sure that you don't play a solo with the same two or three licks over and over and over again. That also gets very monotonous. So make sure that when you play, you're really trying to be as diverse as possible, both rhythmically and um, musically with your phrases. Now, as far as communicating visually with an audience, I had a few ideas there, too. Number one, you want to make sure that once in a while you actually look at the audience. As you may have noticed during the course of this video, I tend to play a lot with my eyes closed. And I have to remind myself to once in a while look up at the audience and actually make some eye contact. Uh, to use an analogy, if you were having a conversation with someone and as they talk to you, they actually never looked at you and they're talking to you and they're talking to you and they're trying to tell you what a beautiful day it is out there and, and yet you're not really getting much of a communication because they're never looking at you. So um, try to look at the audience as much as you can. Um, another thought I had too was to make sure that the audience um, knows that you're there to play for them. We've all walked into clubs uh, and listened to bands and within the first five minutes you can tell if the band is into what they're doing or they're just there to, to make their money. Um, again, uh, well I can relate a, a good story. I was playing in LA about nine years ago in a club and it really wasn't all that big of a gig or anything. And, you know, I, I try to make it a rule to always play my best when I'm uh, in a club. Well, sure enough, intermission came up and up walked Chick Corea. And uh, to my extreme surprise, um, and uh, he was impressed with my playing. He came up and actually sat in with us during the second half of the night. Uh, the next morning, I got a phone call from his manager asking me to play on his next record and to go on tour. So suffice to say, make sure you always play your very best whenever you're playing in public. Um, Oh, another thing uh, that came to mind for me was uh, to make sure that there is no visual impairment between you and the audience, such as a, a music stand. Uh, we all have to read music from time to time when we're playing um, on stage, but um, make sure the, that the stand isn't up at eye level so that the audience uh, only sees your legs and your torso in a big stand. Make sure you have the stand nice and low and off to the side so you can still read the music, but the audience can see you. As far as the other members of the band are concerned, too, the same thing. Uh, as far as music stands or mic stands, make sure that the guys aren't set up uh, behind each other so somebody can't be seen or behind a, a pillar or something. Uh, lastly, I think the most important thing is just to make sure um, that you're always at ease on stage or as much as possible. Um, again, referring back to Chick Corea, we've been playing for a number of years now. We played all over the world in front of uh, many, many different audiences and unusual places and playing um, um, all kinds of music. And whatever we're doing and wherever we are, whatever we're playing, Chick is always amazingly at ease. And you can tell that when the audience sees someone play with that kind of confidence and that kind of ease, they feel at ease listening to the music and they enjoy it much, much more. Well, I want to thank you very much for taking this time with me. And I really hope you've learned a lot of things that you'll be able to use. Unfortunately, there are no shortcuts when it comes to music. But if you put the time and effort in it takes to be a great musician, the rewards will be well worth it, especially if you know some of the tricks of the trade. Thanks a lot. Take it easy. And God bless.